Hi, I'm Dr. Galena, the lead pastor here at Cutting Edge, and this is our official YouTube channel. It's a place where I pray that you will grow and fall in love with Christ and increase your connection and commitment with him through covenant building. We have a saying around here that if you have a covenant with God, then you have a God of covenant and he is obligated to do things with you, to you, through you and for you. Cutting Edge is already a part of some major humanitarian and social activism projects. We feed daily over 80,000 children in Zimbabwe. We help parents with special needs children, and we also are a part of criminal justice reform because we want to see the redemption plan for man. Thank you for partnering with us in your giving. All of our giving information is at the bottom of this screen. We know that you're going to love what you hear here. So please like, share, comment, subscribe right here and turn on those bell notifications. We get pretty busy here at Cutting Edge. And so you may miss us, but right here, you can catch all of our replays. We here at Cutting Edge believe that the four walls of the church is not the only place to experience the love of God. We're here to go to the four corners of the earth, and we're going to show you that this is the way.
Good evening, everyone. I am so glad that you've decided to be here. I'm Dr. Galena, and you are watching Bible Study for Cutting Edge, which is the campus ministry of Realm University. And we are going to get into some amazing, amazing, amazing studies tonight. Um, I have none other than Pillar Robert Cager, who is going to be with me tonight. And we're going to get into, right into, uh, the, 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 the heat of what we were praying about this morning, this morning, y'all, I'm sorry. I went to a place that I can't even tell you. And, um, needless to say that my morning devotion went a little longer than expected, but I'm telling you that God just, he did what he always does. He just shows up. And so I can't wait. We are studying the realms of power, Prior to this, we studied realms of glory, and it's important for uh, for us to understand both realms of power and realms of glory as we get into um, who we are and operating and unlocking the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. It's important for us to um, be well versed, not only in what happens in the church or what needs to happen in a church service, but obviously what needs to happen through us because we have covenant with God. I always say, if you have a covenant with God, then you've got a covenant, a God of covenant and he is obligated. Listen, man, he's mandated to do things with you, to you, through you and for you. And who doesn't want to be used by God? I know I do. I want to be used by God. I want to be in a place and in a relationship where I am satisfied and where I know that what we are doing together is blessing others. And so here we are, we are in this study. We're going to get in the deep of it in just a moment. I'm gonna open us up in a word of prayer, but I want to remind you, all of you that are, are wanting to know what's going on with Cutting Edge and how can I be a part, there is a way for you to be a part of Cutting Edge. And that's simply by downloading our Church Center app and getting um, up on board so you can be connected with everything that we are doing. The um, Under the uh, app, you're going to put in our zip code, which is 60104. And there you will see our logo, Cutting Edge, and just come on, click in. There is where we are going to um, let you uh, get firsthand information on what we are doing as we prepare for our external launch. I know we haven't even launched yet. We're just doing Bible study for you guys right now. We haven't even launched yet, but I'm telling you that it is going to be an absolute uh, uh, just game changer when we do launch uh, as a people. So I'm excited um, for all of you that are, are here. I want to give a shout out on our finance team today. And I, I did this and, and so I can't stop. I'm going to keep going. I have to give it, send a shout out today um, on our finance team, none other than Eric Jenkins. He is a beloved member and of, of Cutting Edge. And I'm so excited for him to be a part of this team. So I want to say uh, happy birthday to you, Eric. We love you. We appreciate you. We need you. And we honor the God in your life. And so we absolutely uh, are just really 
blessed to to have you a part of our team and we just wish you well we wish you god's blessings god's peace god's glory god's greatness shine forth in you and lord please keep giving him downloads and strategies because we work together and i'm telling you it is an absolute uh it is an absolute blessing to move forward with uh with people that love god that are diligent that are skilled that are resourceful um and that have the right motives and the intentions and all that they do maybe he's not uh preaching from a platform or singing from uh, a, a pulpit but i'm telling you that what he does is kingdom work and we honor um our brother in christ my spiritual son and uh our our um your uncle your cousin your, your <laughs> all of that we bless god for him so happy birthday Eric, we love you. Okay, we're gonna. I'm gonna get into prayer, and I'm gonna tell you that tonight. Shh, hold on to your <laughs> your seats, okay? Hold on to your seats because <sighs> for those of you that did not watch the prayer this morning, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, okay? So everything is on our YouTube channel. We are cutting edge. Go to the YouTube channel and turn on those bell notifications. We're just getting you ready for our launch. We have a huge launch that's happening February the 2nd, 2022. That's right, 2 2022 We have a huge launch that's happening on February the 2nd, 2022. And we want to get you this this core team. We want to get you already acclimated. Um, and I guarantee you that the things that we're doing, you are going to want to share and uh, bless the world with. Um, I am excited to be a part of a network of individuals that love God. I'm telling you, the the, the people are cutting edge. Ooh, they are nothing to play with. It is a an extreme blessing and honor to be with them. All right. Let's pray. Let's open up. Y'all, do y'all have y'all pens and papers and laptops and all that and everything? Okay, good, good, good. You got that? You got all your okay. Put the baby down and all right, close the door, lock the all right, get yourselves together. All right, whatever you gotta do, get in, get into your, your prayer closet. It's time to go in. We have been talking about the power of righteousness. Uh, as we go through these powers, these realms of power. And the reason why I titled it The Power of Righteousness is because these powers help you to recognize when you are in right standing with God, um, as well as it puts you in a place, because sometimes we can exude power and we can, uh, over, we can uh, overpower something um, and then it turns into abuse. And I don't know about you, but I have seen and been in abusive situations where someone has used their power uh, and um, and hurt uh, people and other people involved. And so oftentimes we don't want to, you know, use that or look at that at the church, in the church. But I have heard this saying out there in the streets. I don't know if you've heard it. It's called church hurt. Oh, okay. You've heard it too? I thought so. So people are experiencing church hurt. And I think it's because of, there is an abuse of power to some degree. Um, and, in, in, and in a lot of the instances. And so when we stand in the power of righteousness, not only do we know that we, not only do we need to know that we have power, but we need to know how to exact that power, what measurement, what force, um, and in what situations do we exact this power, as well as when we are coming against the enemy, we have to know that we have been empowered by God and by his righteousness. And so this is why this lesson or these this series that we're into in right now, we're going strong. And I'm going to be honest, I don't know when this series is going to be over. This is, this is, see, when I enter into a series, it's not for and we're done. You know, it's when God says lift, then I lift. But we're on this track and we're in this place. And I want you to uh, to be prepared because I truly trust that God has a purpose for um, aligning you with power and righteousness right now. I want to thank all of you that are putting people's names in the comments so that they can get on board and see this. And even if they can't watch it now, you are watching it in your replay. So we welcome you. We honor you. We thank God for you. 
Let's get to it. God in heaven, I thank you. <laughs> King of glory, I thank you for being here. I thank you, God, for leading, guiding, and directing us. I thank you, God, for aligning us to truth and righteousness and power and anointing. For we know scripture says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we want your kingdom to be unlocked. We want your kingdom to be done. We want to walk in the pursuit of of your kingdom and in your righteousness. And so, Father, I thank you for opening up wisdom, revelation, knowledge, uh, righteousness, the fear of the Lord, the spirit of might. We thank you, God, for giving us the spirit of counsel and love and understanding. We thank you, Lord, that wisdom builds its house. And God, we thank you for building in us the house of God. This shall be, we shall be a house of prayer, a place that connects with you daily, moment, Lee, hallelujah, every minute of the day, every moment that we're that we're uh, conscious, God, I thank you that we get to connect with you and you are leading and guiding us into all truth. And so we love you for this. Father, I thank you tonight that minds are going to be set free, healed and delivered. I thank you. You said that we would be uh, that we would be elevated. We would be, um, uh, re when we are renewed by our minds, we would level up. And so, Father, I thank you for the leveling up that's happening. I thank you, God, for the transformation that's happening right now. I thank you, Lord. And, Father, we extract that out of this realm of glory, out of this realm of knowledge and understanding. We bless you in Jesus' mighty name. For it is so, and so it is. Amen. Let's get to it. All right. I'm going to bring forward Pillar Robert Cager. How are you today? Sir. <laughs> Sir. I literally all day, all day have been like, all right, it's, it's going to happen because this morning's prayer, y'all, was took, took over my whole day. Took over my whole day. So I'm ready. Let's go, Dr. Gailey. Let's do it. Let's, Let's do it. Get in. This, this morning's prayer for those of you um, that are new to this channel and you're new to this Bible study. We go into the Greek and the Hebrew, and right now we are in the Hebrew forms of the word of, of power. And so we're studying, and, and I've heard some people come and ask me, some pastors <laughs> have come and ask, what's your resource material? Where are you getting this from? I said, the good word of God. <laughs> go in your Bibles and get, get it out the word of God. This is all scripturally based. Uh, but what's going to be awesome about Cutting Edge and what we are doing for you, we are putting together source material, research material, manuals, and such so that you can follow along with us with these Bible studies. I Trust me, I know these Bible studies are Cutting Edge. These Bible studies are not your, um, your, um, uh, your, your regular Bible studies. We tr trust me when I tell you we want people to be saved, set free, and delivered. Uh, but I believe that you know the church got that covered. They do enough of that. So yeah. Yeah. here's where uh, Robert and I we we deal with those that have, have probably been in church for a little a little longer than a, than a day or a decade, and um, those that really want to press in and get all they can out of their relationship with God understanding yeah. the terms and agreements, understanding uh, what is available to them and what's available to you, this new life in Christ and what that consists of. Because I'm telling you, I would hate for you to get to heaven and you realize that you were not, you were living beneath your privileges. I tell this story and I'll tell it to you quickly that there was a man on a, on a, on a boat and he got on this um, he got on this luxury cruise liner and he saw all of this uh, amazing, um, amazingness going on. And he, it was just so opulent and so beautiful. And he sat by the, 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 um, the side of the, uh, of the Lido deck, you know, what that is or sort of food is. And he saw all these people going in and out and he had, he had uh, spent all his money to get on this boat. And he had a wonderful room. Uh, he always wanted a room with a with a window in it so he could see out and he could see the water uh, at night. And he had that wonderful experience. But he kept going to the deck 
And every day he would see these people dressed in these fancy clothes going in and out of these different restaurants and going in and out of these great shows. And he was like, man, one day I'm going to be able to do that. Uh, and and the more and so the story goes that he literally was on this big beautiful boat, luxury cruise liner, and he fasted because he didn't think that he had enough money to eat on the boat. He comes to the end of the uh, the, the stay on the boat, and the captain says, "How was your stay?" And he says, "It was great, but I'm so hungry." And he says, "Why didn't you eat?" Um, from the from the Lido deck, and why didn't you go? It's seven restaurants here. He said, "Man, he said, because I spent all of my money just to get here." He said, "Didn't you know that everything on this boat was all inclusive? It was free." <laughs> Many of you are in this life called Christianity, and you you feel like you paid it all to get here. You finally in but you are not experiencing the wealth and the, uh, having a true experience <laughs> in, uh, on this boat, in this fellow ship. And I wanna make sure that you are getting everything you can. And my grandmother used to say, can all you get in this fellow ship? How about it, Robert? <laughs> Don't be like that, man. Don't go on no unnecessary fast. We don't do that. Unnecessary. We don't do unnecessary fasts over here. Okay. Unnecessary, unnecessary warfare. Unnecessary. Unnecessary. Fashion. You have no idea what you're connected to. So we hope and pray that as you go through these Bible studies with us, you will understand yeah. everything that you are connected to, everything that you're able to walk in power with, everything you're able to decree and declare and claim. Why? Because you are in a covenant with God. I've got some Christians who told me, Robert, they said, I've been saved for a long time. I've been saved 10, 15, 20, 30 years. I've never, I've never written a covenant out with God. My God. Wow. Wow. I never, I never had a moment where I, all I was thinking about was getting saved. How many, how many, how many of you have a covenant with God? How many of you have written out, God, this is my covenant? with you now you did when you got married wow, you did yeah. you at the i was going to say that we have covenants and contracts with everybody and everything else we got card notes mortgages all of those things right because to do to do life um and to enjoy that realm of living and so in order for you to enjoy a realm of living there's a contract that has to be attached to that but if you want to get access to realms of power and realms of glory, hallelujah, and realms of moving in kingdom order, there needs to be covenant, hallelujah, to have access to those spaces and to those places. That's good, wow. You've written out your expectations everywhere else. It's time to, to focus on the expectations when that you have in your life in Christ. Are y'all ready? Yeah, I love it. I need to step my game up, come on. Let's, let's mess our game up. Let's get into this place, yeah. of covenant, where we have access, yeah, to Wanda, and where we set our expectations. God wants you to know that you have exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever ask or even think according to the power. Guess what? That works in you, not in him. But this power is the power that works in you. So what power is working in you? Let's get to this power. All right, we can bring those back up. Let's get to the, um, we're going to go straight to, the, I know typically we do those other slides, but we're going to go straight into these two powers to the, today. Huh. Now, this is not the power that I prayed. I know some of y'all were like, let's go to, no, no, no. But this is this is one of the powers that just, that hit me. And, I, and I'm going to let, uh, Robert kind of go into it first, uh, but I, I will tell you that if you are wanting to follow along with us, please, please, please listen to the morning prayers because we and the prayer warriors from our Arrow Network, the intercessors from our Arrow Network, pray these on a weekly basis so that you can get them apart and learn how to pray them a part of your prayer life. All right, Robert, take over. So... We're going to get right into it. Today's focus is the Shalit power and the Shalat power. The Shalit power. Didn't you feel glory on that already? <laughs> the Shalit <Yeah>! power <laughs> and the Shalat power. 
Um, I'm excited, y'all. We're going to go right into it. When you look at the Hebrew, um, these S-A sounds, uh, S-A words come into Sha. So that's why we're calling it Shala or Shalit and Shalat power. And so let's go right into the, sh the Shalit power. Hallelujah, the Shalit power. Um, this is the realm where the two realms of wrestling are revealed. This is the realm of power. There are two different kinds of wrestling that happens um, in this realm or that humans go through, um, that we go through in the kingdom of God. There is number one, the first realm of wrestling that you will go through will be the wrestle with the pride of life and the trauma of your history. So I'm gonna deal with that one first and then we're gonna go into the second one which is the promise of God and the testimony of your process. I want to ask you a question. I wanna ask you a question. Where are you in the wrestle? And what are you wrestling with? When I ask you this question, because I want you to begin to reflect on your life where you are right now. Are you wrestling with the pride of life and the trauma of your history? Or are you finally wrestling with the promises of God and the testimony of your process? Where are you in this uh, realm of power? It's the wrestling power, it's the power of the wrestle. I want to I want us to go to Genesis uh, chapter 42 and we're going to dig this prayer out. Um, I'm so glad God brought that verbiage back to me. Dig because uh, God told me to tell you, cutting edge, that you're going to get what you ask for. In this season, you're going to get what you ask for. And um, I know we talk about God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. But before we get there, I want you to understand that there is a power in your excavation. There is power in your digging. There is power in you being able to have a seek um, in this season. In this season, you have to dig. All right. I just wanted to give that prophetic word before we move forward that the Lord said, it's time for you to dig. It's time for you to ask and you shall know that you receive. You shall seek and find, knock and the door shall be open. There is some access that God is going to give you by way of wisdom. And so here is the wisdom on tonight that he's going to start you off with. Now, when Jacob, verse one, saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, why do you look one upon another? And then we want to go down to um, six, through nine. I'm going to read six through nine. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. Verse 8, and Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. Verse 9, and Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them and said unto them, ye are spies, to see the nakedness of the land, ye are come. Now, I want you to now take your attention to, uh, we're going to still stay in Genesis, but I want us to go to Genesis 32. I want us to go to, I'm sorry, Genesis 33. I want us to go to Genesis 33. And I'm just going to read verse 1 because I want to just give you some background. Um, and Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. All right. So I wanted to give this, this, this scripture because I, I, I want to, these scriptures because I wanted to bring a point to you that the Lord began to bring to me throughout this power and this study today. Here you have the two realms of wrestle. Here you have two men in the text that I wanna, that I wanna focus on. I wanna focus on Jacob and I wanna focus on Joseph. Jacob here in this text in Genesis 33 is, has been for years wrestling with the pride of life and with the trauma of his history. He is in a wrestle between his nature and he's also in a wrestle with his brother, all right? He is in a wrestle with his brother because as we know, Jacob was a trickster 
and Jacob uh, and his mother actually operated in witchcraft and control, just like Abraham and Sarah did at a point where they tried to latch on to the promises of God without the way God wanted it to happen. And so Jacob, uh, under the instruction of his of his um, of his mother, um, went ahead and um, stole the birthright from Esau. And so now you find a wrestle between Esau and Jacob. All right. And so here Jacob is in a wrestle. And so you see this same generational curse. He's in a wrestle with his brother. You see this same generational curse of wrestling that's actually on Joseph. And I know we want to glorify Joseph. And I know we really don't want to see anything bad about Joseph. But when you look in Genesis 42, you see that Joseph is still dealing with the trauma of his history in his elevation, in his promotion. And God actually has uh, brought him from the palace, uh, brought him from the pit, to from Potiphar to the palace. And now he is a prince. Even in him being a prince, he is now still wrestling with his trauma. I want to submit to you that promotion does not, and permission does not mean you have let go of your trauma. That's good. Promotion does not mean that you have let go of perversion, of particular things that you've been operating in. And so we have been a church that's been looking at uh, people that got faith or people that's in the glory because they're ascending. But ascending does not mean you are aligned. Woo! Say that again. To the righteousness of God. Joseph in Genesis 42 still was operating in the generational curse. Could it be? that generational curses can still operate even during seasons of promotion. If you have not dealt with the trauma on the inside of you, he saw his brother, what did he do? He spoke roughly to them. He then brought them through what he went through. He brought his younger brother, Benjamin, through what he went, he brought them through a whole trial, unnecessary traumatic trial <laughs> because he was still did he was still was angry about his process and angry about his journey it wasn't until genesis 50 that he said what you did for evil god meant for good and we skip over the the part of joseph still as a prince wrestling and god literally dealt with my heart this week and he said i've made you a prince and i made you a pillar but Robert, you're still holding on to old chapters. This week, you need to let it go. This I was week. like, because here's the thing. This is why Joseph had to let it go. Joseph had to let it go because already we already prayed that redemption, his process was going to redeem his brethren. Okay? We already prayed that this morning. We understand that your process redeems uh, your accusers, right? And it heaps, uh, it heaps coals of fire on them. We understand that. But but something more powerful uh, was going to actually happen through Joseph. There was only, uh, Joseph did exploits his entire life. Uh, one of the last recent exploits we understand that Joseph did was he became a steward of the storehouses of God in Egypt. And so he uh, released storehouses and predicted uh, the next 14 years he, he literally uh, released the next 14 years uh, through the prophetic word of what was going to take place. Seven years of prosperity, seven years of famine, and gave wisdom and strategy. That was the closest exploit we have at that moment. But you know what the next greatest exploit that God wanted Joseph to move in? Joseph wanted God. Oh, I mean, God wanted Joseph. Hear me, son. God wanted Joseph to go and get his father and break the curse in his lineage. Let me tell you what happened. Joseph had an exchange with Pharaoh and asked Pharaoh, he said, can I go back and bring my family 
back to this wealthy place? Can I bring them out of the place? Can I bring my father out of sorrow? Can I bring my father out of a, a, a thought that I'm dead? Can I bring my father out of reflecting over his process and his journey? Can I bring my father out of his generational curses of wrestling with his pride? Can I bring my father out of the curse that he handed me, that he handed down to his sons? Because I've been wrestling with these 11 princes because my father wrestled with his brother, with his prince of a brother. Can I, can I now, and it wasn't, un, it wasn't until he let it go that he was now able to redeem his father. Woo! Yeah. It wasn't until he was able to get over the trauma of his process. And God is not upset with you because you have the trauma in your process. He's upset with you because you won't surrender the trauma to the promise that comes after the process. God understands that processes can be traumatic, but God wants you to change your perspective because not all trauma, not all trauma is meant to have a lasting negative impact on you. There are things, uh, uh, there are shifts and there are elevations and there are escalations that you're going to go through that are, that are actually going to bring an upset to you. And there are, and, and God wanted Joseph to change his perspective, but he couldn't see until he let it go. And so I want to surrender to you um, that the Shalit power is, is, the, is the checkpoint where God is calling you to let it go. Um, I know they hurt you. I know they mistreated you. I know they didn't uh, didn't quite understand how to manage you. Uh, they weren't supposed to understand how to manage you. You weren't supposed because you weren't supposed to be in covenant with them. Anyway, uh, you, so they, they they it was it wasn't their responsibility, not that their assignment to be able to understand who you were and who you are. You expected something out of them that God never gave them the oil for in the first place. He never gave them insight, hindsight, foresight for your life. He, he allowed them to deal with the things that they dealt with. And he allowed their insecurities to deal with, to, 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 to not, not see, this is not about you being necessarily exalted over your enemies like you're better than someone, but God will use somebody else's insecurities to reveal the insecurity in you. To reveal the trauma in you, to reveal the broken places in you. God will use somebody else's hiccups, traumas, setbacks, delays, temptations, trials, situations, whatever, uh, 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 moments in their flesh. He'll let their humanity get on your nerves because he wants to see, are you going to continue to wrestle with the pride of life? Or are you now going to grapple with the promise and let me change your nature so that I can now release an open heaven over you and you could redeem not just your brothers, but your father? Because the promise was released to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Joseph had to forgive and move in reconciliation because he needed to make sure that the promise, the covenant promise that God gave Abraham would still flow through him. And so I want to let you know that trauma, that your perspective about trauma is about to cost you the flow of the anointing, the flow of the yeah. promises of God, the flow of what God said over your life, because you keep submitting under trauma when God wants you to submit under the testimony of your process. That's what you submit under. You submit because the Bible says that the spirit of the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. He wants you to submit under the testimony of Jesus, because yeah. that's how you move. That's how you move in prophecy. Yeah, they taught you utterances. They taught you word of knowledge. They taught you activations, but they didn't teach you the spirit of prophecy. Woo! They didn't teach you the testimony of Jesus. All right. Where, where, where the prophets at? I know y'all on here. The real prophet prophesies the testimony of Jesus. The real prophet moves in the testament, the covenant. I was praising God this morning about the covenant of the Lord. And I said, God, I thank you 
for the new covenant. And he said, I couldn't redeem you under the old covenant. He said, I couldn't release promise for you, son, over the old covenant. So I brought a new covenant. And under this new covenant, wherever there is the power of your trauma, I'm going to release a covenant to you. So let me tell you right now, I'm, I, I, I'm hoping that your traumas, not just your sins and iniquities, but your traumas are before you. Because I want to tell you right now that where there is a trauma, there is a covenant of mercy. There is an exchange that's happening right now for every trauma. Yes. There is. That's what it means when it says where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Yes. Where there is a trauma, yeah. God wants to bring to you renewed covenant. So that way, the flow of the promise can come through you and can yeah. come through your seed. If that does not take place, you will live under a brass heaven. And it will not be open to you. And God is not obligated to do anything with you, to you, for you, or through you. Because righteousness demands forgiveness. Yeah. Righteousness not only demands forgiveness. Righteousness demands uh, uh, um, um, the standard of righteousness, which is reconciliation. And reconciling yourself. Reconciling what the trauma was to what God is trying to release to you. So let me say that in a different way. What helps you to redeem a moment is you have to take it. I wanted to make sure I drill this point home because God is giving you com com um, uh, converting power right now. What helps you to redeem a traumatic moment or a traumatic relationship or something that was didn't go well was your ability to take that moment and to put it up against God's intent for your life. And when you do that, the teacher is going to be revealed and released to you of the Holy Spirit. And God is going to begin to allow your trauma to be a moment of lesson and teaching for you rather than to rather than to terrorize you. It's going to teach you, not no longer terrorize you. And so, you know, when you are maturing, when your trauma no longer terrorizes you, but it teaches you the way of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want to, before we go into the, the next one, um, Shalot, I want you to look at this um, symbol right here. This is Shel Shalet. Shel Shalet, you see it like a squiggly line. Um, this is a cantillation, which in the Hebrew, when you're, when you're reading or writing in Hebrew, um, you see this symbol. This is a symbol that you uh, would find or and is actually only found in four places in scripture. Mm. Um, but it is it is written over and about the character in scripture where there was an internal sh uh, struggle. Mm. Um, this is where they had a power struggle. And so this is why we can verify Ooh. that what uh, Robert is saying is true because it is found in Genesis. Uh, the 19th chapter, the 24th chapter, the 39th through the 42nd chapter, with he, which he was just talking about, Leviticus 8 and 23. And this is, so these words that are accented with the shalash shalak mark, uh, they occur usually at the beginning of the verse. Um, and it translates in English as chains. So this is a connection between, um, this is a connection as Robert was saying, between the two people, as well as uh, or the 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 generation. So Jacob had this was a connection between Isaac, Jacob, and Abraham. This was also a connection, you know, from their traumas to this trauma, all the way down to Joseph. So we see this connection. This word shalat, it, it it has um, um and when it is sung and i said it this morning in prayer when it was sung when it is sung yeah um obviously the, the jews will sing the torah there is this is a place where they wave within their voices right they they have the, uh, that wave <laughs> i know y'all know what it is and typically we see it a lot or hear it a lot when we listen to uh what we would think is ancient music or arabic music or hebraic music you hear that a lot. And so what it is signifying is that even though they know they are the called of God, they are still there are struggles that we Ooh. have. 
on the inside. Huh? I think that's why black folk run. We see when we sing, we run. Ah, we run, right? I can't do it right that's now. That's good. Because it is a sign, it is a vocal sign that we are experiencing struggles on the that's inside. Good. So just because, again, just because, like Robert said, you have promotion or you have power, it does not negate the fact that you are going to have struggles. And that you're going to have to deal with traumas and that you're going to have to overcome traumas. Go ahead, Robert. I'm glad you said that because your unchecked trauma is going to put your brother in prison. It's going to sentence your chain. brother. Chain. Ooh. The chain. Joseph put one of his brothers in prison and held him in captivity yeah. because he had not allowed this realm of power to check him. So I want you to understand that don't look at your promotion. Stay with your heart checked and in a place where you understand, all right, God, you taking me to this place. Let's do a survey. I'm telling you right now, I call Dr. Galena and I say, this is about to happen for me. Read me. Read me. Read me. Where's where, where's my pride? I call my mother, my which is my my, my wife, Paris Ashley. We're, we're we're okay. This is happening for me. Where do I need to grow? Where do I need to develop? What am I still wrestling with? I, well, you know, what am I still struggling with that you see that that's gonna that's going to that's going to cause. That's going to cause because whether you understand it or not, thank you, Jesus. The fact that the fact that Joseph was putting, hear me by the spirit, Joseph's trauma was putting his brother in prison. But what he did not understand was that he was locking up the nations of Israel. His trauma was about to destroy what God wanted to release through not just him, but all 12 nations. I, I need y'all to understand. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. He had a choice. And thank God that though he did that, um, his choice shifted. Yes, um, he did. And, and I, I spoke this and preached this before that during this season, Joseph um, did not cry when he was in the pit. He did not cry when he was in prison. He did not cry even tears of joy when he was promoted. It wasn't until he got to his brothers, the scripture records in the 42nd chapter, that he actually cried, that that is where he finally got lamented his release. when he when Yes, when he got to his brothers. And so that is where the chains were broken, when he finally got to his brothers and he told his brothers, I am not upset at you. This was, again, after he had put his brother in chains. This was, again, after... He took them through uh, uh, all 12 tribes through interrogation. This was what happened after. So he, in, in this place, after this particular struggle, he then finally released, he finally cried and he finally broke the chains. And again, it was his voice that shifted, that became the sign. Uh, it was his song, if you will, that became the sign that the chains were broken. Mm -hmm. So we want to thank God for Tasha Cobbs for the song. But And I, I see some other people saying, uh, Ariel said, the vocal sign of, in, of the internal struggles. Absolutely. Bree yeah, said, why, that yes. is why some of the best songs come from pain and trauma. Absolutely. And this is why we're able to express, even as African-Americans, we're able to express a lot of those traumas um, in those spiritual songs that we did, those Wade in the Water songs, those uh, Trouble in My Way songs, those those um, 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 what's the what's the one? A uh, Swing Low, Sweet Maria. All of those songs that have uh, the vocal cancellations in the, in there that that cause a shaking and cause a quaking. Um, those were songs that were written Wade in the Water. That was a song that was written for those to make a choice to either go on the Underground Railroad or not. And so uh, the reason why I want to connect this, obviously, is because I just did the, the class on um, on music and yes. what happened, happening in worship. But what yeah. a lot of what happens in the musical side of worship is what happens in us physically, is what yes. happens 
with us mentally. It's what happens with us emotionally. And it is what happens with us um, as far okay. as our process. And it and it really tells a story or it really pinpoints, I should say, it pinpoints where we are in our story. All right, I want to get to this next power because yes. you know us, we can we can go. And I decided, I said, you know what? I'm going to make sure we get to these realms of power and then we're going to get into the rest of the rest. All right, I'm going to let you start with your power. I feel and you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, I, I feel you. Woo. I feel you. Y'all, y'all let it go. All right, now you can move in the. Did you let it go? Because here's the thing don't wait to let it go after the Bible study. Let it go now because this is where your power is. All right, and this is where your help is. So let's go to the Shalak power because when you let it go, you can enter in uh, like Esther. And so let's read about what Esther uh, moved in. I want, I love this king queen, I, I love her. She's one of my favorite. Uh, yeah. people in the Bible. Whoo! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So this is the realm of power where God does a few things, all right? Where there are a few things actually that takes place. Number one, this is the realm where God reveals and reverses the plot against you, okay? Number two, this is where the king asks you, what do you want? <sighs> all right? Number three, this is where Holy Spirit causes you to make. There's a typo. Forgive me for that. This is where the call. This is where the Holy Spirit causes you to make decisions for your life. I was typing fast because I just was like, did it. I was feeling the power of God. Uh, where Holy Spirit causes you to make decisions. I'm sorry, decrees for your life. He causes you to make decrees for your life. He causes you to make decrees for your life. Woo. So you hey. go for Jesus Christ. And then number four, where a new covenant is established for your generations that even the other nations will be made to submit to because it was written in the book. I'm going to say that again. This is where the Lord, and I actually walked you through a, a whole story process and summed it up the best way I could. Um, and it's, but I, I walked you just through um, a, um, an experience and a journey that Esther and, and Mordecai went through and King Osarius went through and Haman and, and the Jews, okay? These are the characters um, in Esther 3 and Esther 9 and other people were at play as well, but these are the main uh, 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 people at play in this, in this story. And so this is the realm, again, screenshot this with your phone, do all of that, but this is the realm where a new covenant is made over your generations and that the, the covenant that's made for the generations and over your life is what the nations will submit to. I told you as well that when the Lord has you in a covenant, everybody around you has to, uh, with that word, submit everything and everyone around you has to make accommodations for the covenant of God on your life. And so this is why when you're walking as a king, um, that, the, that the earth moves and shifts according to the covenant that's on your life. Everything has to has to accommodate what God has put on your life. The negative side effect of not being aligned to the not being aligned within this power is that you're actually going to be mastered by the opportunity that God wants to present to you instead of mastering the opportunity itself. This is where you are unequipped in kingdom exchanges. This is where you do not know how to set up a, a conducive environment and atmosphere to engage with a king um, because you are a person that is not operating in uh, covenant diplomacy. And so in order for you to be able to exchange with the king, there is covenant diplomacy that you actually have to move into. And I want to kind of break this down from what the Lord began to show me in my studies. I'm going to take you to Esther uh, chapter three, real quick. Esther chapter three is where we find, um, this is where I'm going to take us to five and six really quick. Um, I want to take, I want to take it, um, uh, actually five through nine. Let's read five through nine. And when Haman saw that Mordecai, which is, um, Esther's cousin, but it, but became Esther's, uh, covering and like a father 
um, to her just to get to the point. I know Dr. Galena gonna bring this out. I know this is one of her favorite stories. And so I'm excited to hear her after I go as well. But, and when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. Haman was a chief prince um, in this kingdom. Um, and he had uh, power to decree, he had power to make treaties, he had power to release things um, over the lives of those that were under um, the king, King Asharius, all right? And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of, of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. This is Haman released um, a decree to destroy all of the Jews in the whole kingdom. In the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the 12th year of King Asarius, they cast Pur, that is the lot, or pure, that is the lot before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the 12th month. That is the month Hadar. I'm going to let you know right now that the enemy is trying, has been trying to, this is why you have to let the trauma go because the enemy has been trying to cast lots against you. There's a scripture that says, David said in Psalm 119, while princes curse me and talk against me, I will meditate on your law. I will meditate on your word. Your meditation, your ability to meditate on the covenant of God is going to give you the upper hand um, when the enemy is trying to cast lots. Jesus said, Peter, the enemy desires to sift you as wheat, but I pray for you that your faith will fail not. Let's go. Verse 8 says, And Haman said unto King Hasarius, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. He's talking about their covenant. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written, please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. Here is where Haman is now about to, is, uh, has and the story goes where Haman uh, begins to take the king's ring and he gets the king to sign an edict um, and he an edict and a release to destroy the Jews. He paid for it. He released it. He paid for the death of all of the Jews. Some people are dealing with trauma in such a way and so upset with the covenant of God. Certain environments. Let's take it away from just from people, but there are certain environments. And certain atmospheres that are going to be that are so upset with your covenant that in the realm of the spirit, this is what this is the realm of warfare that Esther moved in. In the realm of the spirit, they're going to be atmospheres that are going to try to pay for your demise. But here, here, here is what covenant will do for you. All right, Esther, being a woman that stayed in covenant and stayed in relationship with God, I'm kind of moving fast through this for you. She stayed in covenant with God. This is what the Lord was able to release to her. I want you to go to Esther chapter 9. I want you to go to Esther chapter 9. In between es Esther 3 and Esther 9, God gives Esther and Mordecai wisdom. And Esther creates an atmosphere and a feast to dine with the king. Diplomacy um, is going to, diplomacy is very key. And this is one of the main things that Realm teaches how to exchange and how to have a conversation. This is why your character has to be intact because God is going to cause you to deal with people that are not going to have the same covenant as you, but they're going to be able to have, but they're going to want to have a conversation with you and they may not have covenant like you, but they're going to want to have a conversation with you because of the character you have. There was, a, there was the standard of God on Esther and she was chosen. The history of the story of Esther was because of the, her process and her actually going through the process that she went through. There was something that God had placed on her that the king saw. So the king saw that her character and her demeanor stood out from every other virgin and every other woman. This is the realm of power where you stand out because the character makes you stand out that for such a time as this, that's where we get that scripture from. For such a time as this, Esther now then creates a table in the presence of her enemies. Haman invited his own self to the banquet, wasn't formally invited, but Haman, the one that wanted to kill the Jews, invited his own self to the banquet that Esther set up to, for the king, and he didn't know 
that he was actually being set up for the curse to be reversed on his head. He didn't, he didn't understand that. Let's go to Esther 9. This is why character is important. This is why the divine nature is important because the divine nature causes you then to move into diplomacy to be able to exchange. And here is where in Esther 9, it's 32 verses, but I'm going to read a few of them because I want you to understand what, what, what happened. Let's go to, so Esther begins to talk to the king and she ended up letting know what Haman had did. And, uh, and, and, the, and, the, um, and the hatred that Haman had against the people. She said, by the way, king, I'm a Jew as well. Your wife is a Jew. And this is my covenant and this is my standard. I want to tell you that you do not have to compromise. I want to bring this down and make this extremely practical to you. Esther is a queen, king queen that represented a woman that would not compromise the covenant that she had even if it would have cost her life because Mordecai, she had a conversation with Mordecai and she said, if I perish, I will perish, but I will not compromise from the standard that I am called to live. And I'm telling you right now that your covenant, her, the, her decision to perish is actually what caused her to prosper and what caused her to actually live and not die. In Esther 9, here is where you see that the Jews, verse 2, says that the Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king as a result of Esther living out her covenant and not compromising. The, the Jews got all together to lay hand on such as their hurt and no man could withstand them for the fear of them fell upon all people. This is where the, literally the Jews gained the strength from Esther's decision. The nation of Israel gain strength from Esther's willingness to, to, to not compromise and unwillingness to compromise, they released the strength. They received the strength to now be able to kill the armies that wanted to kill them. When it got all the way down to verse 10, everybody else was destroyed, but Haman, the, the real power and principality, that one, the one that released the decree, was still alive. It says the 10 sons of Haman, the son of uh, Himatha and the enemy of the Jews slew they, but on the spoil laid not their hand. And on that day, the number of those that were slain in Shushan, the palace, was brought before the king. And the king said unto Esther the queen, the Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the palace, and the 10 sons of Haman, what they have done in the rest of the king's provinces. The king said, now what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. Or what is thy request further? And it shall be done. And so the king is now asking, we're now moving in, in, in realm two or level two. This is where the king is asking Esther, what is it that you want? I've allowed you now to reverse the curse and I've allowed you now and your people to now begin to kill their enemy. What is it that you want? Esther then says, I actually want the head of my enemy. I need you to hang Haman and his sons. The king says, all right. Let's make another decree. I want to let you know that the same enemies that, 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 that are trying to be released unto you are, are God is trying to give you head hanging power over your enemies. But if you keep wrestling with your trauma, you will never be able to move in a place where you now have the strength to stay in your covenant. Because I'm going to tell you right now that trauma will cause you to compromise. Woo! If you stay, it will tempt you to compromise. But because Esther was in a place that was, was in a place of covenant and she, uh, she did not allow any of the systemic uh, injustices around her to take her focus off or even the possibility of her people and the trauma of the, of the release of the enemy over her life, she didn't allow that traumatic word or release to cause her to compromise and to say and to hide. This is the season where God is demanding that you come out of hiding with your covenant. All right. This is where you have to be bold with what God has said to you for you not to come down from the wall. I want to end my point and my part by going to the end of Esther 9. I want to go to the end of Esther 9. 
There is power in letting it go because when you let it go and you now move in the strength of God to, to maintain your covenant, excuse me, you then begin to, God puts you in power and you begin to name your season and you get an opportunity to name your day. <laughs> Dr. Cindy Trim talked about commanding your morning and commanding your day. You move, when you, when you move outside of your trauma and you begin to move into, and I'm staying with that language because I recognize that that's where a lot of us have been in the pandemic. And the reason why it's time for you to come out of hiding with your covenant because that is then going to give you the ability to do this, name your day. And now you get to name and decree your season. I want us to go to, I'm trying to see which verse in all in verse nine. I want us to go to, let's start at uh, verse 24. Let's go to verse 24. Because Haman, the son of Hamatha, the Agathite, the enemy of all the Jews had devised against the Jews to destroy them and had cast per, that is the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that his wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. Wherefore, they called these days Purim, after the name of Pure. All right? After the name, and then therefore all the words of this letter and of that which they had seen concerning this matter and which had come unto them. The Bible then goes to say in 27, the Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them. So as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year. And then 32 says, and the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. Here is where Esther, as a king queen, as I close my point, the reward of not compromising is her decree was recorded and was documented and impacts the Jews today. And the power of not compromising your covenant, because there are going to be a release of promotions and opportunities and things that are being presented to us right now in this season. But there is going to be a temptation. I need you to hear me. There is going to be a temptation for you to compromise the vision, the mission, the plan, the assignment, the instructions. And the Lord said to me, he said, Cager, he said, before I manifested, I released wisdom and instruction before I called you to cross over. Whenever you understand that I'm about to manifest something, I release instructions and I release wisdom. And so here is a warning. If you don't pay attention to the wisdom, you will give into the temptation <laughs> to compromise what God said to you. The wisdom is here to guard you in a season of promotion. Woo! The wisdom is crying out to guard you in the season of promotion because this realm of power presents you with an opportunity to either compromise your covenant or the reward is to name your season, to name your day and to mark this day as this is the day that the Lord has made. And for the rest of my life, I write this covenant as, as a memorial and a commitment that for the, not, not for just a year, but for the rest of my life, I'm going to live the way I need to live and remember you for what you have done. And so many of us are used to having types of covenants in circumstances and situations where it's seasonal. The church trains us 21 day fast, 40 day fast, but I want to let you know and submit to you Oh my God, Dr. Gailey, the church has not taught you how to live with the everlasting father. Okay, all right. The church has not taught us 
how to have stamina with what God said to you. The church does not teach us how to be able to utter the words that Christ said, it is finished. Will you be able to say, it is finished? I finished what you told me to do. I finished, I completed. Not only did I complete, but I lived out my life in a way. That's why Paul said, I fought the good fight of faith. I ran a good race. He was saying, I lived according to my covenant and I did not compromise. And so the, the Lord brought to me this week, he said, what I'm about to do with you, Cager, is I need you to let, I need you to, 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 I need, I have, we place an expectation on God, right, with our covenant. And I put, I place an expectation on God. And he said, now this is my expectation of you. I had a dream and I'm not going to go into the dream, but Dr. Galena was actually in the dream and it, and it, and it, uh, and it let me know I had this dream this morning. And the Lord said to me, will you be in covenant with me forever? I said, what do you mean? He said, there is a particular way that I need you to live because it's attached to your eternal purpose. And it, it, and it, and it hurt actually what he was asking of me and what he was requiring of me. And what I'm here to, what I'm here and what I mean by hurt, because it's going to, it's going to cause you to miss out on particular things, but Dr. Galena said that many of us are still grieving over what God told you to give up. And you have yet to come into the place of, and the reason why you have not seen victory, because you have yet to come into the place where you made a resolve to now be able to name your day. If you would just name the day, that this season, this day, this is the way that I'm supposed to live belongs to God. If you would just do that, you would then find oil and assistance and help and grace to be able to maintain living the way that God calls you to live. There are some things that God calls you into season, seasonal fast, things of that nature. But then there are some things that you are going to, you're going to uh, have to live out forever. This realm, I'm help, Fran says, you are helping me. There are some things that are going to be seasonal. And the church has only taught us how to live a seasonal life with God. The church has only taught us how to walk with God. Um, uh, uh, and we shift to, to the point where we're not consistent. And so the, 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 the generational curse of inconsistency comes from our, in a, our teaching and we've been taught that God wants us to live this way today and God wants us to live this day tomorrow. And what's, what was happened is that we have not, we have not allowed God to actually bring us into a place where we say, what is my eternal purpose and how am I supposed to live so that way I can maintain the oil and the glory that's on my life. And so I'm kind of teaching from my training and, and to bring it more practical, there is a realm of when you get to transforming, and I'm ending. There is a realm when you get to transformation, because I didn't actually know I was going to hit this, but God is ministering to me. There is what I'm teaching you. When I'm training a client, there have been a few clients uh, that I get to, and they transform. But then I tell them, if you want to keep these abs, if you want to keep this waist, if you want to keep this strength, there is now a regiment and a routine and a realm that you're going to have to live in in order for you to consistently experience the reward of where you're living at right now. And so I just want to simply submit to you that God is asking you, are you willing? So this is what it's really meaning not to compromise. Are you willing to, to, to understand the regiment, the routine and the rhythm that God has caused you to live in? God is calling you to live in so that way you can experience the reward of naming your season and naming your day and hanging your enemies. Are you in a place where you are asking the Lord, how do you want me to live during this season of promotion? How do you want me to live during this time of crossing over, during this time where the promise is manifesting? Because for me, there are certain promises that I can't say right now that are manifesting. And I'm watching my nature and I'm watching who I am and I'm watching what God is doing in me. And I'm asking God, I said, all right, God. And God is asking me, this is how I want you to live. 
And here's the thing. God is not asking us to do hard, hard, uh, uh, press traumatic things. It's actually going to be things that's actually going to bring oil of joy. It's actually going to bring freedom. It's actually going to bring liberty. But I wanted to submit to you that this is the realm of power where the Lord moves you into naming your season because you stay committed to your covenant and you would not compromise. Amen. Isn't it awesome that the Shaleh Shalab power is, is one that you recognize God's ability through you as well as you are recognizing the struggle that you are personally in. Wow. To just see both of those together, the internal structures, we know the story. And yes, you're right. Esther is one of my favorite stories. I've probably preached Esther more than I've preached any other thing in scripture. Yeah. 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 And so I'm very, very well versed on Esther and who she is and who she's connected to and how the connection of Esther goes all the way back to um, Genesis. And the reason why Purim is so important to the Jews today is because it is, a, it is the holiday, if you will. It is the, the marker that actually from the time of Cain and Abel to Esther, we see a full Yibam restore. We see the restoration. Wow of the fullness of Yibam, which means that the blood that cried out during the time of Abel, from Abel's blood crying out all the way to Esther and Esther crying out on behalf of her people, this is the full Yibam. So all three brothers are restored in this, Cain, Abel, and Seth. Wow. And at the beginning, Cain, who kills Abel, um, Abel is restored by Seth. The next generation, Seth then restores uh, Cain. And then the next generation, Cain restores Abel, whom at the very first generation he killed. And so I'm not going to go through all this storyline, but I will tell you that the descendants of those brothers finally or at the end of the line, which the end of the line ends with Esther, all three brothers' lives or seed is redeemed. And from the place of redemption, three generations later, we find that Esther is the great grandparent of Jesus, right? Or I'm sorry, of David. And so obviously, and then out of the house of David, we 12 lines later, there comes Jesus. And so what we do see is at the end of the restoration of the struggle, three generations later, we see now the 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 transfer the restoration turning into transformation, and that transformation turning into a kingdom restored. And so the kingdom is restored in the wow. time of Esther, and then after Esther, the the um, which she restores the kingdom. And if you if you go on and read that 20, 23 through thirty you will see that Mordecai takes now all of the decrees into 127 provinces, yes. which basically is from, uh, e from Eastern Europe, um, e e all of Eastern Europe, all of Asia, all of Asia Minor, all of the, the North of Africa, all the way from uh, to the the top parts of North America. And we literally see, yes, you see North America covered in, uh, in scripture. So we see that there is a restoration and there is, uh, so Esther literally, Esther and, um, Esther and Mordecai set a precedence for all of the known world. For all of the known world. And it is, she does this during the time of struggle, inner struggle. This is why she said, if I die, let me die. If I perish, let me perish, right? 
because she had an inner struggle. The inner struggle with do I, as Robert said earlier, do I compromise? Do I or do I keep silent? Or do I keep silent with a compromise and not tell him who I am? Or do I go and do this? And so we see that she fasted and prayed and had those around her to fast and pray to break this and cause herself uh, to get into a place where she could stand in the power that God had given her. So this is a power. And a lot of times we think when we have power, then we've got all of the confidence in the world. But having power is not the same as fighting for the confidence to actually execute on that power. Having the confidence in God is not going to come by anything else but your belief. And this is why this morning in prayer, I dealt so strongly with your belief in God, uh, because it is your belief in God that then begins to uh, instruct um, you and give you the verbiage and give you the context and give you the things that you need in order to actually carry out the, the, the type of power that you have. When that power is released, then there is a glory revealed. So the glory that was revealed then was the fact that then they operate and they are actually the kings and the queen of the kingdom. We see that um, Ahasuerus, he dies three years after marrying Esther. So then Esther, the queen, becomes the king of pretty much the entire world, right? She becomes the queen of the entire known world, the entire known world. One person, one woman who was the underdog and the underbelly of society becomes the queen of the entire world. And so Purim is a holiday that they not only um, celebrate, the Jews still celebrate today, and word Purim actually comes from the word broken pieces, meaning that I got here on broken pieces. How many of you, and I'm going to come to an end, how many of you... <laughs> have come to a place of promise hey, God. the power of the mighty God through the broken pieces. Listen, you didn't think you were going to make it. You didn't think you were Jesus. going to get here. Ha, my God, but the broken, but you got here even on and even with the broken pieces. And what they did was they decided to celebrate the broken pieces. And what's so amazing is these broken pieces today as they celebrate, do you know that Jesus himself, this is the time of Pentecost. This is the time whoo, in the New Testament that they go into the upper room and the Holy Spirit comes and dwells amongst them all. And we see the fire, the power by fire, uh, as likened, likened unto cloven tongues. We see the power uh, of Acts and all of the power that happens, the activity that happens in the book of Acts because of the shell shalet power. Now, it's only mentioned four times in, in the Old Testament or in the Torah, but it's mentioned over and 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 over again in the book of Acts because this then becomes the supernatural power. So for those of you that want to know, how do you operate in supernatural? Let me just make it personal. Dr. Galena, how can you operate in the supernatural power? It's because in oftentimes the places and the times where I'm called to move in the supernatural, where even this past Sunday, there was a bottle of oil that filled up in the hands of my uh, adjutant after, as we were praying and laying hands on people. They were receiving miracles and healings and walking walking out of wheelchairs. Yes, that all happened. But we didn't enter into the realm of the supernatural until the oil filled again. You know where that came from? That came from a struggle that was on the inside of me. And instead of relenting to the struggle, because, oh, there was a struggle inside of me. Instead of relenting to the struggle, I chose God. I chose the assignment that he put on my life. 
even though there were some broken pieces and some broken promises and some things that had not been fulfilled that were supposed to come to me, I had to, I had to move in another direction. I had to move towards God. And when that happened, not only did miracle signs and wonders happen, but we moved into the realm of the supernatural. This is what happens when Pentecost falls. When you come into alignment with God above all else, when you come into alignment with God above your problems, above feelings of isolation, of, above feelings of, of trauma, above, above feelings of trying to be vindicated or eradicate some things or cause vengeance, this, ooh, this is when you move and you jump over now into the realm of the supernatural. And we're not only see we're not only seeing God work through us, but we're seeing God work for us. This is the part of the covenant where God is not only working uh, with you, and and He's working to you, but He's working for you. Ah! And he begins to not only decree a thing for you, but for your children to come. And so if you read that ninth chapter of Esther again, you'll see that he begins to work for the children above. I'm not going to go into it because I'm going to come to a close quickly. But I will tell you that we had one, one more scripture up there. And that was in uh, uh, Ecclesiastes, is it? Yeah, Ecclesiastes. And let me just tell you about Ecclesiastes because I'm not going to go into it. I want you to read the, the entire chapter, chapter five, because it talks about the fear of the Lord. It talks about reverencing God and walking in the fear of the Lord, which means walking in, walking in circum, being circumspect to the power of God, not the fear of loss. And I prayed this morning again, the difference between the fear of loss and the fear of the Lord. We cannot move according to the fear of loss. We've got to move according to the fear of the Lord. And Esther, she was challenged with the fear of loss. If I tell him who I am, I could lose my position. I could lose my favor if I tell him who I am. And Mordecai said, listen, I'm trying to do you a favor. You talking about fear of loss. Let me tell you about the fear of the Lord because we going to be all right. We He'll come another day. Right. Giving you an yeah. opportunity. So she gave Esther, he gave Esther an opportunity to choose either the fear of loss or the fear of the Lord. And I guarantee you, when you operate out of the fear of the Lord, if you connect with him, not just the power, are you going to see that you're going to work in the supernatural? But you're going to see evidence in your children's 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 children. This power has legacy attached to it. This is why this said it became an eternal covenant for them. It became an eternal promise for them. It became something that they do even today. The Jews do even today. And they remember this is this is all the time. This was the appointed time that Jesus himself. Listen, 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 Linda. This is the appointed time. A thousand years later, when Jesus himself ascends back to the throne to be in, I, talk, I talked about this earlier, in seated power. He went and he was seated in heavenly places on the right end of the Father. Gave him the power then to intercede. He became an intercessor. <laughs> Intercessors. In order to move like Jesus, you've got to be in seated power. So you've got to deal... And you've got to struggle. I've, I've, I've been dealing with some intercessors personally recently that they have been coming against some inner struggles. <laughs> it's because God is trying to release this particular power in your life. You've been dealing with some inner stuff. You could go here, fear of loss, or you could go here, fear of the Lord. You've been dealing because you've got some stuff that you want. You need to read Ecclesiastes the fifth chapter, all of it, because then it goes between verses eight and uh, verses 20, highlighting verse 19. It begins to talk about the vanity of wealth and honor. And it talks about if you don't check this power, the fear of loss is going to move you into vanity. But if you get this power checked, you're going to move in the place of honor. And not only, and so what honor does is honor restores and honor rebuilds, honor refocuses, 
and Anna reestablishes. And this is what happened to the house of the Jews from the times of Cain and Abel, his blood crying out. He finally, they finally get a full sense of Yibam. And I'm not going to teach it now. I've done it before. They finally get a full sense of Yibam or a full sense of restoration because of what Esther did in this chapter. I'm going to let Robert pray us out of this portion. This Shalet Shalet, this Shell Shalet power, again, uh, this, is the, this is the power that causes us to cry, that causes us to tremble because we've got some issues on the inside of us that need to be reconciled to God's righteousness. And I'm telling you, <laughs> lift my hands. We've been, I've been in some shaky places. And not only have I been shooken, but I've caused other people to shake. And, and I, I heard a good friend of mine, I heard something that he said to me that he said, you know what? You've made me afraid of you. I had to get in prayer real quick and check myself. I had to check my motive because sometimes we say things because we want to be heard. We want to make sure we're being seen. And, and, and listen, we're selfish. We, we can get very, very selfish and manipulative because we want to have a power to move things in the way we want to move it. I had to get in prayer and I had to recognize because, and, and he said this to me, he said, you have to be careful of your words because your words carry weight. And I'm telling you, every part of the conversation, I was getting checked and he didn't really mean to. He was just letting me know, listen, and if you say this, this is going to happen. So you need to be careful with what you say. And I promise you, I heard the Holy Ghost and I said, my God. Let me really check because see, if my flesh is sitting in the driver's seat right now, I'm going to tear not only me up, but I'm going to tear up everybody and everything connected to this. And if I know what I know, and I know that I'm connected to a lot of people, I'm going to wreck some generations. And I've got to make sure that I'm checked by the Holy Ghost before I do something that I don't want to do. And so thank God for the Shel Shalet power or the Shalet power and the Shalat power that allows us that even when we are shaken, the Bible says, I shall not be moved just like a tree. It's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. Woo! I heard a uh, pastor Todd say that this is bamboo season. That bamboo is not going to be moved. It may sway, but it's not going to be moved. Ah! You are fit for this place. You are fit for this time. You are fit for this season. You have the resistance in you. You've just got to make a choice. Robert, why don't you pray for us as we make this choice? Yeah. Father, when I God, we love you. We honor you. We thank you. Um, I'm broken in your presence because I recognize that what I thought was going to give me access what I what we think is going to give us access is not. You're asking for the broken pieces of our story. And what I saw as Dr. Galena was teaching, Father, was us lifting our broken pieces to you. And I saw them turn into keys. And the very things that we think was going to disqualify us is actually the very things that God is going to use to justify us in the courts of glory. And so this is why God, you command us to turn our struggle into a song, a song of worship. And so today we make a decision to take every moment of trauma and to sing a melody through it to push it out of our system, to push it out of our belief system in the name of Jesus and to cause us to have joy. David said, 
He encouraged himself in the Lord when everything around him was broken and everything around him was traumatic and everything around him caused him to feel restricted and alone in a cave. He took that moment and began to minister unto you. Yes, and so if we would just take our misery and turn it into a place of music. We turn our misery into music. We make it into a song. We make it into a, a, a lyrics of worship. And we pour out our brokenness to you. And that is what you're going to use to open the very door that we've been trying to get through by networks and connections and hookups and green rooms and back rooms and compromise. In the name of Jesus, but I decree and declare in the name of Jesus that will, will cause us to be resolved and give us the strength and the confidence and the faith that Dr. Gillian is talking about, Father, is the fact that we give our worship to you. We give our brokenness to you. We give the broken places and the broken pieces and the same broken pieces of silver that they use to cast lots over us, to count us out, are the same broken places and the same broken seasons. That is, that's paying for our liberty. For by your blood you purchased us. By the same 30 pieces of silver that they used to hand you in Jesus. Those pieces of silver shed your blood and purchased us and bought us into a place of redemption and righteousness. And so God, I thank you for the very things. Yeah, that's, yeah, 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 yeah. For the very things in my story that I've been ashamed of. I thank you that the very things that these people have been ashamed of, you have just literally taken away the shame. God says, I've taken away the shame of your story. That's what's keeping you in that cycle. <laughs> the shame that we have because we went through certain things, regret and remorse. The, uh, we, we're, we're repenting over things that we don't need to repent over anymore. We're regretting over decisions and things we made and we're uh, crying over and, uh, and abusing ourselves and tormenting ourselves over places in our process that you're actually using to pay us, to pay us at the, in this season and beyond. In the name of Jesus, I thank you that from this day forward, when we're feeling a moment where we're feeling uh, uh, disqualified or feel like we're not enough, or feel like we don't have enough to get access, you're going to ask us, pull from the broken place what do you have pull from the broken place and and as we pull from that broken place and move into worship it will give us access into the places that we thought we weren't able to move into it's in jesus name that i thank you that from this day forward we will move like esther and we get to decree and declare our day and set a day of remembrance that this was the day that the Lord spared my life. This was the day that the Lord brought me over. This was the day that the Lord brought me over and into the everlasting door of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. I just I just have to release a testimony. I can't give detail. I can't give detail, but there are two things that I'm praying God for. I'm working on this last thing, but there was something that happened to me, Dr. Gellin, this week. I just didn't have enough for it, for my family. Whew. I didn't have enough for it. I did, I did everything I could this week. And I said, God, I don't, I don't have it. The Lord said to me so clearly, he said, pull from your history. I said, what do you mean? I pulled from my history. In the, I can't give detail yet, but I pulled from my history. I forgot about a price I had paid uh, over the last uh, year and I submitted that experience and submitted that trial actually and I got an email today and they said Kedra you were approved now I can't release it but I want to release to you that approval is going to come to you from the place of your brokenness <laughs> you thought it was going to be your charisma you thought it was going to be your gifts. You thought it was going to be the fact that people like you. You thought it was going to be uh, all of that. You thought it was going to be uh, your money. You thought it was going to be all of that. And while money does answer a lot of things, I'm telling you right now that it is going to be your history with God. And that's what Esther was creating. She was creating uh, an experience for the people of God to have history so, so that they could move 
forever in a season called approval. Yay! Thank you, Jesus. I love y'all. I'm done in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So good. So good. It is received in Jesus' name. I want to tell you that though the Jews read the Torah, they also read the story of Esther, which is which they call the Megillah. And they read it at the times of the feast and the festivals, the times of rejoicing. Wow. They read about the story where they were about to lose their life right before their greatest victory. I'm talking about he made the entire planet, all of the provinces, not only sing their praises, but they had to adopt their ways. The whole world had to shift and adopt all of the ordinances that Mordecai writes and goes and he and Esther, the duration of her reign, they go from city to city and they release the ordinances of the Ooh. Lord and they transform the entire nation. And so from their brokenness, woo, from the people, the Jews, their brokenness, this Megillah, during the times of Pyramid, during the other times of festivals, is, is read and sang, and they have a party, and they, they celebrate the time. Y'all remember when I was down and out? Y'all remember when I was broke, busted, and disgusted? Y'all remember when I didn't have nothing? And they take the book of Esther out and they read it and they celebrate and they write songs of victory concerning this time frame when the enemy thought woo, that they were going to eat of his flesh. They were going to uh, destroy them because he stumbled and he fell. And so I want you to be encouraged in this time and I want you to worship and praise and put a praise on it now, y'all. I, I I had to shift my excitement because I wanted to make sure y'all heard me this time. Because last time I couldn't literally couldn't get off the floor, and I've got so much more. But I'm gonna enter into a time of worship. We're gonna enter into a time of giving okay. in this hour. We're going to give. I want you right now on the bottom of your screen. You're going to see ways to give, ways to um, support this ministry and this word. Um, don't miss out on this part of worship. Don't overlook all that you just got. Um, yes, maybe you're a pastor, maybe you are a pastor buyer, but you ate tonight and you ate good. And the revelation of the word is not only going to just be good to your ears and tickle your ears, but it is transformative for your life. And so we are asking you to give in this moment. You can zell us, you can cash app us, you can PayPal us. You can even, you can also text to give, or you can go to our church center app. Um, you can download that on your phone right now. And there is a give button there as well. We want you to be a part of this, um, this growth and this movement. Yes. A mighty and a major way. As you can see, we're human. We've got needs. We've got uh, things that we need to do in order to stay in connection with you. And it is going to take um, all of us giving in, even in this hour, so that we can push this forth. Truly, this has been a blessing to me, and I wouldn't take anything for it. I'm telling you, I am sold out. I am commissioned by God to do what I am doing. I trust in him. Listen, I trust in him. And I know that I know that I know that God is making a way out of no way and that God um, has aligned us for this moment. I'm excited about what God is doing in your life. I also want to know your, give me your testimony. I had a client today and she gave me her testimony and she said to me, she said, uh, and, and I, I want to play it, but I'm not. She said to me that she had some mentees in her space while I was mentoring her. And because they saw the transformation in her, they saw the light in her eyes. 
that they themselves begin to change and shift as well. Now they are uh, uh, they are uh, siblings to a high priority case that's in the news uh, news media right now. And if I said their names, you would know exactly who they are. So I cannot release that. But I will tell you that they just got some justification for the death of a loved one. They just got it. And they said, but because they went through the strategies of Dr. Galena, which, listen, these are God's strategies. But because they went through these strategies, they said that when they heard, even in this terrible situation this that's in the national news, and they could have had a whole different um, feeling and idea and, and, and they could have gone a whole nother way about it. But because of the word that I've been giving through Cutting Edge through the, to their mentor, who's been giving them the same process, the Lord shifted them. And they are now operating at a whole different level. And even the lawyers and even some of the uh, news media are saying, how are you able to deal with this devastation like you're dealing with it? And they said, because gay Lena. <laughs> and of course, I'm saying, uh-uh, because of God. But I'm telling you, the wisdom that you learned tonight, you can take this and transform your the world. The world. And so I want you to go out with what you have. The best way for you to reinforce this teaching in yourself, in your mind, and in your heart is to tell somebody else. So in your giving, yes, I want you to give uh, to us financially, but I want you to find somebody. I want you to focus in on somebody right now that needs this word, somebody that needs this transformation, somebody that mentally, physically, emotionally, financially needs a, a, a reprieve and needs a resting place. If you read in Ecclesia in, in, in uh, Esther, the ninth chapter, you will see that the Bible declares that their enemies left them for a season. Isn't this parallel to Jesus that when he had gone through the temptation, internal struggle again. So again, this is where this power was released again while he was on the Mount of Temptation. The Bible declares that the enemy had to leave him for a season and y'all check this out and the angels came and ministered to him this is the realm of the supernatural this power opens you up to the realm of the supernatural i'm telling you i experienced it myself so god is ready to and waiting to respond to you you ought to respond to him. And I guarantee you, he's going to overwhelm you. He's going to over, 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 over extend himself and do for you what you would never be able to do for yourself, what the world would never be able to do for you because he's God. We love you. And we bless you in Jesus name. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for those that have given, that have given of their time, that have given up on doing things their way, that have given in worship. God, we are in a place of surrender right now. We're surrendering to you. We're surrendering our will. We're surrendering our way. We're surrendering our finances. We're surrendering where the enemy will want us to put our focus and attention and our heart. Woo, because we know that where our heart is, there is where our treasure is. So God, I pray that right now we shift and we find that our heart is, is treasure and our treasure is in you. It's in your leading and your guiding and your direction and in your release. So, so Father, we wait, right, we wait right now for your response. I want y'all to flip y'all's hands over and just receive. God, put us in a place of receiving right now. I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost. God, I pray right now that all that they have received that they would feel right now the weight of your glory i sense that god 
is releasing his glory in your house, in your room, in your car show. By the power of the Holy Ghost, I thank you, God, for releasing who you are. I don't know if you're feeling what I'm feeling. If you're feeling what I'm feeling and you know what I'm feeling, I want you to just put a one up on the screen. Just put a one. I'm the one. I'm the one. I'm the one. God is doing it in me. I'm the one. I release. The power of the most high God in your house in your car, wherever you are, on the replay. I'm the one that God is speaking to. I'm the one that God is ministering to. I'm the one that God is refilling and refueling and repowering and readjusting. Hey, hey, that God is showing himself strong and mighty in. I'm the one. Hey! There is no distance in, 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 in prayer. There is no distance. Hey, 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 God is meeting us at the same time in this metaverse. Oh, hey, Right God is destroying the weapons of the enemy right now. And I sense and I see that God is destroying. Everything that the enemy set up against you. To not everything that challenged you on the inside that you almost gave way to right now, everything that the enemy put in front of you to destroy you, it shall now serve you. And the enemy has become your footstool. I'm one that God is blessed. I'm the one that God has chosen. I'm the one that God is going to bless. I'm the one that God is going to bless. I'm the one that God is going to bless. I'm the one. 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 This is for me. God is doing this thing for me. Oh, <laughs> I'm the one, I'm the one, I'm the one, I'm the one, I'm the one. Woo! Now let's give God praise one time. Yay! Woo! Hi! Yes. Yes. Woo! It is over. It is done. It done, my sister. Come, come on, Elder James Simon. Shift, shift, shift! Woo! God be glorified. Hey! And the devil be horrified. He has done great and mighty things with us and through us and for us and to us tonight because we are in covenant connection with him. I know we had a good time, but there may be someone, whether you're here now or on the replay, that you don't know Jesus in the pardon of your sins. And listen, we are all sinners saved by grace. Do you hear me? We are all sinners saved by grace. And so if you want to receive all of what we got and then some, woo, you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord 
and personal savior. That is the decision that you ought to make. That is the decision that I'm coming with you with. And it is as simple as this by saying, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner, but I'm so glad tonight you came and saved me, saved me by your grace, by your blood that your son Jesus shed on the cross for my sins. Tonight, right now, I make the decision to make you Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for redeeming me and setting me free. <laughs> if you pray this prayer and you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins, I'm telling you, you've got access to everything that we just talked about, prayed about. And all I want you to do is stay tuned with us weekly at 6.30, Wednesday evening, Central Standard Time, and 6 a.m. And if you need something right now, you can go to our YouTube channel. And you can, listen, I have said that how many times have you sat, we sat and watched and binged on Netflix and other things. I have and looked up and it was the next morning, but I binged because it was so good to me. You can do that right now on our YouTube channel and go through all of the studies that we have gone through on a weekly basis. We can't wait. And we want to hear your testimony of what God has done and is doing in your life. We love you to life with everything we have. God bless you. We'll see you soon.